Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so you know how, like, when you introduce someone, you always say it's like my honor or it's a real privilege. It's like always a lie. <laughs> Rarely is it an honor, and it's usually not a privilege. But in this case, it really is. And so um, I'll give you sort of the usual introduction. Uh, so we have our speaker today is Dr. Bill Darrell from Florida International University. Uh, Dr. Darrell got his bachelor's degree here at the University of Connecticut in uh, economics. He has a PhD in sociology from Emory University. Um, and he really spent the first half of his career at the CDC. So he was at the CDC working in sexually transmitted diseases in 1981 when a cluster of cases of the unknown disease uh, started to spout up in big cities around the country. And so uh, local health departments looked towards the CDC to try to find an answer, and there wasn't an answer. And Bill Darrow was a part of the team, the uh, task force in 1981 that the CDC put together to try to figure this out. So the story of, um, uh, of the origins of HIV infection in this country are really centered around the work that Bill did. Uh, and it is, it is a really truly remarkable thing. Um, he's currently at Florida International University at the, in the School of Public Health where he is a professor. Uh, he works with a lot of students and, um, and is very actively involved in efforts to eradicate HIV infection in David Broward County in Florida. Um, he's won a number of awards. He's actually a native son of uh, Norwich, Connecticut. He's been uh, awarded uh, from his hometown. Uh, he's been awarded the Sociological Practice um, Award from the Society for Applied Sociology. Uh, he's a distinguished alumni of the University of Connecticut. Uh, he's been quoted many, many times in the history of HIV. I think what's kind of lost a little bit though, we're gonna hear a lot about those early days today and making some connections. But I think part of what is often lost in talking uh, about Bill Darrow is um, his more contemporary contributions to being a real um, advocate for behavioral sciences and a real voice of reason at the CDC when he was there for prevention, often fell on deaf ears, I think. But, um, but, but that is, I think, a very important part of Bill Darrow's story, that he's a, a real champion for behavioral sciences and prevention and trying to do something about HIV infection. So it really is an honor and a privilege to introduce Bill Darrow today. Thank you very much, Seth. So nice to see you again. And uh, for those people that I haven't met yet, so nice to see you for the first time. Uh, so as my first slide suggests, I, uh, and as Seth said, I'm a professor at Florida International University, and I feel as though I have to say that we've had our share of troubles lately. And we thank you for your support and for your prayers. And when it comes time to vote for more reasonable gun legislation, I hope you'll consider the terrible tragedy that we had to live through at Marjorie Stoneham uh, Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and uh, more recently, the terrible um, crashing down of a pedestrian bridge right outside my office at our university, which you probably have also heard about. Some terrible things have happened, and I think that we need to be concerned uh, that uh, such things don't continue to happen in our country. The three pictures that are up on the slide in my introductory uh, remarks are a photograph of the Centers for Disease Control as it looked when I worked there from 1963 until 1994. It looks completely different now. It looks more like an armed army base with, uh, with, with a fence outside and security guards everywhere and all kinds of warnings about not to lead or not to, to walk off the beaten path. But that's what it looked like when I was there. You'll see no fences, uh, free access. People just came and go. I didn't even have a badge back then. I didn't even have any identity. I just came and went as I pleased. In the middle, you'll see the card. And, and back then, things were so different. If you can read it, you'll see that not only did I give my business address, but I also gave my home address so that people could cause me at home. Can you imagine doing such a thing in this day? 
And then finally, there is a picture of me actually presenting to the task force on Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections in uh, the early 1980s when I had returned uh, from a visit to California and wanted to present some important information. And I'm going to be talking about that information as I review some of the aspects of the epidemic that I've been working on now for, uh, I guess it's 37 years. So um, these are the main points that I'm going to try to cover in the limited time that we have today. I have an enduring interest in the field of public health, and I'm constantly defining and redefining the field as I learn more and more about the profession of public health. So I'm going to be talking about public health. What is it? Before I started working on AIDS in 1981, I worked on a number of other projects uh, associated with sexually transmitted disease. Take a look at me, you'll see I'm a white man. Believe it or not, I was part of the Tuskegee study. I was one of the subjects. How could that have happened? A physician by the name of Dr. Uh, Joseph Caldwell came into my office one day and said, I'm going over to Alabama to check on the health of some African American men before I want to go, I want to check out all of my equipment and all my procedures on somebody here. Would you be willing to serve as my patient? So I was actually, I actually went through the same procedures that Dr. Caldwell used at the time to try to see how much uh, the, the organism that causes syphilis had done damage to the men that he was following up on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Tuskegee study and how it came about. I'm going to be talking about patient zero and how he got his name and should we know what it is. And I'm going to conclude by talking about evidence-based public health and a path to the future. I'm going to offer a few answers. Just to make sure that there's no confusion for those of you who have seen the film and the band played on, there is a character in there by the name of Bill Darrow, which happens to be my name. It's played by the actor uh, Richard Mazur. That's a picture of Richard Mazur. In the middle, you'll see the employee pass that I actually had and that I am a real person. And I have been uh, associated with the field of public health for now 57 years. So some people might want to say that I'm as old as ketchup. <laughs> so let's begin by looking at this question. What is public health all about? Well, public health was defined almost 100 years ago by a professor who I think has given us the very best definition I have yet seen. His name was Professor C.E.A. Winslow. He was at that new school of public health that had just opened at Yale University in New Haven. And he gave a speech to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And his speech is published in the journal Science in 1920. And for all of those who had not yet heard about the new field of public health, he defined it as the science and the art, the science and the art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through organized community effort. So there's a starting point in considering what to include in the field of public health. And from my many years of experience at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which was actually called the Communicable Disease Center when I started working there, I quickly learned that diseases first come to public attention as outbreaks, and if you don't respond quick enough, they can become epidemics. And if you don't respond quick enough to epidemics, they can become endemics. And if you don't respond quick enough to endemics, they can become pandemics. So there is a series of order that we need to be concerned about. And the best thing to do is to stop outbreaks before they become epidemics, endemics, and pandemics. So when I returned from graduate school with my doctorate of philosophy from Emory University in 1973, I was told that I was going to be chief 
of the Behavioral Research Activities Unit at the Venereal Disease Program. And I said, okay, fine. I'm happy to take this new responsibility with my newly awarded PhD, but I think I need to define what it is that this unit is going to do. So I came up with a definition of how we were going to approach the social and behavioral aspects of sexually transmitted diseases by drawing from the information that I had gathered as a student in the Department of Sociology at Emory University. And I began with this conceptualization in 19, that was published in 1976, uh, in, in, uh, and I cite the publication there in a book uh, by Sal Gordon and, and, and Roger Libby. And I said, there's four things that we really need to focus on. First of all, we need to focus upon those people that seek services or should seek services for sexually transmitted disease. And we tend to know these people as patients, contacts, and suspects. Patients are people who've come to medical attention or getting treatment. Contacts are people who've had exposure to these agents but are not yet uh, seeking medical care. And suspects are other people who share the same sexual, sociosexual milieu and might therefore uh, have been exposed, not through direct contacts with known cases, but through some indirect uh, uh, associations with people who are cases. But we don't just focus on the people who are victims of disease, who are, who, who, are, who are acquiring these diseases. We also need to focus on the people who are responsible for doing something about it. We need to look at health providers, and they come in different flavors, too. There are physicians, there are nurses, there are venereal disease investigators who are responsible for going into the field and finding cases and referring them to treatment. Most importantly, we need to look at the interactions both among these people and between these people. So the third component of interest in a social and behavioral approach to sexually transmitted diseases should be this concept of exchange. So you give me gonorrhea, what do I give you in return? Or you give me treatment for gonorrhea, what do I give you in return? All kinds of combinations of inner, uh, inner relationships are important. And as a sociologist, I was very interested in studying, learning about, and understanding those exchanges. And finally, the environment. Now, I show it there as the United States because I'm working for the United States Public Health Service. I'm focusing on what's happening here. But I'm not only interested in the physical environment, I'm also interested in the social environment, the cultural environment, the context in which these exchanges take place and people interact. So that's where I began with my conceptualization of what it was that this new unit should do. And then I had to take a look at the different kinds of behaviors. And I began with the process by which somebody becomes infected and becomes a patient or doesn't become a patient. So I broke down the behavioral aspects of sexually transmitted diseases in this original conceptualization following the venereal disease algorithm. Okay, so we say you don't get any of these diseases and now we know of at least 37 diseases. And I'm not counting Zika and Ebola, which have recently been shown to be sexually transmitted as well as transmitted through other means, but there are at least 37 different diseases, viral diseases, bacterial diseases, that can be tr transmitted through, through a single act of sexual intercourse. So we could start with that, okay? And sexual intercourse comes in all kinds of varieties too, you know, all kinds of different things that people do. And we need to know about those different kinds of behavior and how they're related to the acquisition or the failure to, to transmit an infection. But you don't stop there. It's not just about sex. There are other things that we have to be concerned about. And they can be broadly uh, considered to be health behaviors, prophylactic behaviors, illness behaviors, and of course, studying sociology and Talcott Parsons, I was very much interested in the thing called the sick role. That people, when they become sick, they have certain privileges, but they have certain obligations as well. And that seemed to follow very well with the algorithm that I show up there. If you want to become infected with a sexually transmitted disease, you got to be very careful who you have sex with. Because if you have sex with somebody who's not infected, there's no way you're going to get infected. So you have to pick somebody who's infected, not only infected, but is infectious, that they can pass the disease to you. 
And then once you become infected, then you are capable of transmitting the disease to somebody else. You might develop signs and symptoms. You might become infected. You might seek treatment. But notice there's two patterns here. There's the black root and the red root. If you fail to seek treatment, then you can continue to spread disease. But if you do get treatment and you're cured for a bacterial disease, that makes you susceptible. And you can become infected again. And you can spread the disease to other people again. And so I became interested in the reinfection process, not just the infection process, but the reinfection process. So we have to study what some social scientists call recidivism. Why is it that some people get a sexually transmitted disease once and never get it again, and other people get it again and again and again and again? And that's where I began with these studies that I was doing. Notice five years before anybody knew anything about HIV and AIDS. Whoops, I went the wrong way. Okay, with that background, let me now talk about my involvement in the Tuskegee study. I can tell you for the most part, when I uh, uh, went to CDC in 1963, I knew very little about the Tuskegee study. It was even kept secret from the staff who was there. They didn't want us to know about it. I really didn't know much about it until Dr. Joseph Caldwell came into my office and said, I'm going over to see some African-American patients in Macon County, Alabama. I want to try certain things. And he said to me, what do you know about the Tuskegee study? And I said, Joe, I know very little about it. He said, I know about it and I think it's a bad thing. I'm very uneasy about doing this. I've been asked to do it. I'm a medical officer. I'm serving. I'm going to do it. But, you know, from what I've seen and heard, it doesn't sound very good to me. Well, look what uh, Van Newkirk wrote in not too long ago, June 17th, 2016. The terrible toll of Tuskegee. Writing in the June 17th, 2016 edition of the Atlantic, Van R. Newkirk II states, the Tuskegee study is perhaps the most enduring wound, the most enduring wound in American health science, known officially as the Tuskegee study of the untreated syphilis of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. That's what the study was called. The 40-year-old experiment run by public health service officials followed 600 rural black men in Alabama with syphilis over the course of their lives refusing to tell patients their diagnosis, refusing to treat them for the debilitating disease, and actively denying some of them treatment, all in quotes. Is there anybody in this room who had never, has never heard of the Tuskegee study? <clears throat> you all believe that's true? <clears throat> Look, this is the next point that I want to make. It's about the terrible truth of Tuskegee. On page one of Bad Blood, a wonderful book, I highly recommend it to you, published many years ago by James Jones, he clearly states, he clearly points out that 399 men had been diagnosed and treated, diagnosed and treated for tertiary syphilis. And 200 men, free of the disease, which means they didn't have it, they didn't have syphilis, were chosen to serve as controls. The study was a collaborative project of the United States Public Health Service, the Alabama Department of Health, and the Tuskegee Institute. So you can see that Mr. Newkirk got a few things wrong. Most people don't know about the facts as described in the book Bad Blood by James Jones, who was a historian, still alive to the best of my knowledge, wrote this book and published it and came to CDC to tell us about it in 1981, the same time that we were beginning to find out about cases of what is now known as acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So what is my point? Public health is not just the simple definition that I gave you at the outset by Dr. Winslow. Public health is also a combination of facts, fiction, and folklore. What are some of the facts about the Tuskegee study? 
According to the 1930 decennial census, at the time Macon County, the seat of Tuske uh, 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 where Tuskegee is located, the population was 82% black. The prevalence of syphilis was 36% according to a zero survey that was done in 1929. That's the prelude to the Tuskegee study. The United States Public Health Service with this Wasserman test that they had went throughout southern, the southern region to see how serious the problem was. And they found that over one third of the population tested in Tuskegee was infected or had evidence of infection with syphilis. And 1,400 syphilis patients were started on a nine month course of therapy. When all of a sudden, the private foundation that was sponsoring the project, the Rosenwald Fund, uh, the Rosenwald Fund stopped supporting the study. There was no NIH back then. There was nobody else supporting this. This was not a government supported study originally. It was originally supported by the Rosenwald Foundation. That's Sears Roebuck. And with the crash, Wall Street crash, 1929, they didn't have much money. And so they could no longer support, which was originally a treatment study. Do you see that? Everybody had received some treatment. So what is some of the fiction that we talk about or should talk about with this study? Syphilis patients received no therapy. They did, they started on a course of therapy, but it had to last at least nine months and it wasn't much fun. The course of therapy was based on original formulation called Salversan 606. It was developed by uh, Paul Ehrlich in Germany in 1910. And during World War I, the Germans cut off the supply of this drug. So Americans developed arsphenamine, which was very much like it. But arsphenamine, as the title suggests, contained arsenic. It's a poison. The treatment for syphilis at the time was not only an arsenic injection, but it also involved mercury salves, rubbing the body with mercury. And the main effect was to raise the temperature. It was probably the raise in temperature that killed off the bacteria, okay? But that was the treatment at the time. And you had to get these shots once a week for a nine course, uh, a nine month course of therapy. Doesn't sound like much fun, does it? Syphilis patients were infectious, that's false. They were all treated and they were non-infectious when they entered into the study. And the US Public Health Service conducted a secret study. As James Jones pointed out, that's not true. At least 14 papers were published in the scientific literature. And at the time, I, as I told you at the beginning, when I got to CDC, it was secret in the 1960s, but it wasn't when it began. So part of the folk folklore is that black men were human guinea pigs in this study. Black physicians and nurses had nothing to do with the Tuskegee study, which was false. It was a collaborative study. And if you want to see an excellent film about the Tuskegee study, you must see Miss Evers Boys, which is about the nurse that was involved in the study for almost 40 years. Her real name was Eunice Rivers. The film is an excellent one. I show it to my class on the ethics of public health called Miss Evers Boys, and I highly recommend it to you if you want to know what happened. So black physicians and nurses had nothing to do with the Tuskegee study. They had very much, they were very much involved and Tuskegee study was entirely ethical. It began as a very ethical study, one of the best at the times in my opinion, but things devolved. And if you're involved in a study that lasts 40 years, believe me, you're gonna make some mistakes. And they made some big mistakes. The biggest mistake, of course, was in 1943 when penicillin was shown to treat syphilis. It was thought by the physicians at the time that the treatment would be more harmful to these patients who had tertiary syphilis. So they suggested first and later probably went way too far in denying the patients the opportunity and the right to choose for themselves whether they would receive penicillin or not. They made the decision that penicillin might be too harmful and the study must go on. Why do I keep hitting the wrong button? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna leave the Tuskegee study and I'm gonna talk about the second point, which is patient zero, the man and the myth. And you'll see two figures up there. 
The first, the man with the dog, the beard, that's Randy Schultz, and he's the author of this book, and the band played on, which was published in 1986, five years into the epidemic, and uh, was made into a movie in 1993, uh, where my character is played by Richard Mazur. And the second person is identified as Gaetan Dugas, an Air Canada flight attendant. I've got a couple of bullets up there, let's work through them. Patient Zero was introduced in 1987 in California Magazine as the man who brought AIDS to California. He was never introduced as the man who brought AIDS to the United States in that article, to California. Two, Patient Zero was identified by Randy Schultz as Gaetan Dugas. Randy Schultz was the person who put a name on this person. Patient zero. No person from CDC had done this prior to 1987. Why? Why did Randy Schultz out patient zero? Why did he do it? The answer is to provoke public health action. Randy Schultz was a gay man, didn't know if he was infected, but had done many of the things that were described in the epidemiologic reports as being related to this horrible disease. And he wanted to know, why isn't the US government? Why aren't doctors? Why isn't the gay community? Why isn't the press pushing forward a response? Nobody's doing anything, people are dying. He was mad as hell. As suggested by the proverb, a stitch in time saves nine. The failure of public health authorities to address the AIDS outbreak in 1981 had led to a worldwide pandemic. The outbreak became an end epidemic. The epidemic became an endemic. The endemic became a pandemic. The same man, Gaetan Dugas, was called Eric in a book published three years earlier, and no one paid any attention. <clears throat> so what are the ethics of identifying patient zero and other so-called first cases, or believed to be first cases? Actually, Mr. Dugas was one of many accused of starting a disease outbreak. In 2009, five-year-old Edgar Hernandez of Lagoria, a pig farming town in Mexico was, uh, was identified as being the first case of swine flu epidemic. In 2014, a toddler playing in a bat-infested tree in Guinea may have sent Ebola spiraling across West Africa. In October 30th, 2016, New York Times article reporter Donald McNeil Jr. asked if it was necessary to trace the source and identify the index case of an outbreak. Why do you want to do this? Well, I can tell you why we wanted to do it, and I'm going to get into a little more detail in this a few minutes, because we wanted to know what the cause of the outbreak was. Who the persons were didn't matter to us when we were working at CDC. But if we didn't know the cause, then we couldn't develop a remedy. So we had to try to find the cause. How do we do that? What is the cause of AIDS? And how is this thing, whatever it is, represented by the pronoun it, how does this spread from one person to another? So as uh, Professor Kalishman said, at the beginning, CDC conducted a case study to first of all define what this case was, then did a case control study, and after that, a cluster study to report and identify on the cause of AIDS. What happened was, that during the case control study, the person that conducted that, Dr. David Auerbach, talked to a man who said, you know, my friend, my partner, my lover is dying in the hospital. There are two other young men who are dying in the same hospital, got exactly what he has, and they have all had sex with each other. Dr. Auerbach said, ooh, wow, we hadn't thought about that before. Let me call CDC and see if they'll send somebody out here to help me interview the patients the 19 patients that we know about in the Southern California area and see if they also have had contact with one another. <clears throat> so the call came, I went out. A flight attendant 
for Air Canada was named by four patients of the 13 that we were able to interview as a common sex park. Sex park. The outside, originally labeled O for outside of California, case patient O was linked to four patients in New York City as well. A cluster of 40 AIDS patients linked by sexual contact strongly suggested that the cause was an infectious pathogen that was being transmitted from one person to another, from one man to another. And when I was a graduate student in sociology at Emory University, I'd heard about social networks, particularly James Coleman and how he had showed how high school students form social networks of friendship and so forth. And I applied that concept and the drawings that he suggested by using coins and pencils, first of all, to show this now uh, uh, quite often referred to slide indicating patient zero in, in the center of the diagram as an important person because he linked four cases in Los Angeles with four cases in New York, strongly suggesting that it wasn't a genetic problem, it wasn't an environmental problem, but that it was an infectious disease agent. Now this story just does not die. It continually is being revisited and has been revisited most recently in a book published by a historian from Cambridge University named Richard McKay. The book is called Patient Zero and the Making of the AIDS Epidemic and is based on his doctoral dissertation. Historian Richard McKay was interested in presenting the AIDS patient point of view. Most histories are about doctors and scientists and people who make amazing discoveries. How about the people who suffer from the disease? Why don't we hear from them? And of course, one of the best books about that is Judith um, Walzer Levitt's book on Typhoid Mary. You know, Mary Mallon was a real person who uh, was locked up and put away for 29 years because uh, of the fact that she had typhoid and uh, was never convinced that she was sick. So writing in that vein, uh, Rich McKay is a student at Oxford University, now he's at Cambridge, wrote this book. His recently published book focuses on two gay men who died from AIDS, a flight attendant that I've introduced, his name is Gaetan Dugas, and a journalist named Randy Schultz. Gaetan Dugas was falsely accused of starting the AIDS epidemic. Randy Schultz named and characterized Gaetan Dugas in the book and the band played on. McKay's book explores the reasons why the author of Band decided to name Gaetan Dugas and other gay men without their permission or to portray Gaetan Dugas as a monster who spreads disease. So one of the decisions that Randy Schultz made in order to attract attention to the AIDS problem and to promote action was to name people by their real name without their permission, without their consent, without consulting them. And oftentimes he got this information from gossip or from what we call in sociology participant observation because he was a gay man and he went to the bathhouses and he went to the bars and he walked the streets of the Castro and he heard the rumors and he saw the people and he saw what they were doing and he put this all into this book. It made a lot of people mad, a lot of people angry, okay? So another point of view is being presented in Richard McKay's book. So now I've got another book on my reading list for you to read about uh, how all this came about and, and what it might mean. So now we're back concerned with syphilis again. So here's a headline from the front pages of the New York Times. Syphilis surges across America, dateline August 25th, 2017. A front page article from Oklahoma City reports, quote, syphilis returning here and around the country, another consequence of the heroin and methamphetamine epidemics as users trade sex for drugs, end quote. On September 5th, 1961, I began my career as a venereal disease investigator of BDI for the New York City Health Department doing exactly the same thing as these uh, characters shown in this slide are doing. Here they're being referred to as a sisterhood of sleuths and notice they're around the table talking about cases. So here we are in 2017 doing essentially the same thing that I was doing in 1961. 
The United States Public Health Service has established the goal of syphilis eradication by 1971. Ten years, this was going to happen. It didn't happen. The program was based on case finding, case holding, and case reporting. Now, take a look at the program that we have right now for HIV prevention. What is it based on? I argue it's based on the same thing. It's based on case finding, partner notification, case holding, think about the therapeutic cascade, case reporting, surveillance. I call this the Looney Tunes version of sexually transmitted disease control. Okay, I don't know how many of you watch cartoons, but when I was growing up, I used to watch cartoons. You had to watch them in order to get to the feature program. And one of the cartoon stories is about these two characters, Wild E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. And the story is about Wild E. Coyote developing all of these contraptions to try to capture and control the, uh, the, uh, the, the bird, the pathogen. So, and the story is never give up. You know, we're going to try all of these different things to try to catch it. Well, this is the story of public health, too. Because here we are, the good guys like Wild E. Coyote, the public health professionals trying to capture these terrible pathogens that cause disease and death. And uh, we don't seem to be getting very far. We're doing much of the same things that we've been doing for about 100 years. So I'm thinking, how should we social scientists help Wild E. Coyote catch and capture the roadrunner? The point that Seth made, I'm a huge advocate for social sciences and the behavioral sciences and see the strategic role that they need to play in infectious disease control, not just in chronic diseases and other problems, but also in infectious diseases. So let me tell you a little bit more about this. So there are actually two poxes, right? The great pox and the small pox. The great pox is another name for syphilis. The small pox doesn't exist anymore. It's the only disease that has been eradicated. Smallpox caused by variola virus was eradicated in October 1977. Syphilis, the great pox caused by Treponema pallidum, was scheduled to be the next in line, but things haven't worked out as planned. Why not? Smallpox was eradicated by vaccinating around a case. Syphilis was to be eradicated by treating with penicillin around a case. But as I pointed out in my earlier diagram, the VD algorithm therapy allows for reinfection. So by treating a person, you're making them susceptible. Susceptible, They can catch it again. They can spread it again. And so the thing continues. To understand and interrupt sexually transmitted infection transmissions in communities, study and intervene in sexual networks. Now look at that graph up there. In 1981, when I was called upon to join the task force on Kaposi's sarcoma and opportunistic infections, we were trying to control syphilis. And here's a study of contacts originating from patients interviewed in New York City and Los Angeles and where they were located, all over the place. You see how easy it is in this current day of air, air travel and rapid communication, getting around all over the place, how easy it is for pathogens to spread. Whereas back in the days when we had trains and, 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 and sh ships going across the ocean and so forth, or even before that when we didn't even have that, it was virtually impossible for pathogens to escape from the jungles of Africa or the Amazon or other parts of the world, which are now uh, are made possible because of many things that have happened. So in the minutes that remain, I want to talk a little bit about evidence medicine, evidence public health, and a way forward. So there's a picture of Archie Cochran, a very important epidemiologist, and a person who was very much concerned about medical decision making. So he's the guy that essentially launched the evidence-based medicine <coughs> movement in 1971, an approach to teaching and the clinical practice of medicine intended to optimize decision-making by emphasizing the use of evidence from well-designed and well-conducted research. 
Evidence-based medicine classifies evidence by its epistemological strength and requires that only the strongest types coming from meta-analyses, systematic reviews, and randomized control trials be used to make recommendations and guide clinical practices. Evidence-based medicine requires new skills of a physician, including efficient literature searching and the application of formal rules for evaluating the clinical, the clinical literature. So that's the original formulation of evidence-based medicine. Note the fourth bullet. There are also problems, real problems in my mind, with evidence-based medicine. Because evidence-based medicine relies on random, randomized controlled trials being funded. So you don't get any data if you don't do a randomized control that is going to be considered in a meta-analysis, right? You gotta have the strongest possible evidence. If it's weak evidence, they probably are not gonna consider it. So then there's a bias because only study, certain studies become funded. Secondly, they have to be properly conducted. Thirdly, they have to be honestly, and fourthly, completely reported. So oftentimes in the published literature or even in the supplements, you can't find the answers to the questions you really need to know about the validity of that study. And science, what is science? Science means that whatever you do can be replicated by somebody else. If you only find things one time in science, it doesn't really matter. You have to find it again and again and again, right? In order for it to be strong evidence. Well, how often is that going on? So a real problem is replication in a variety of different places, in a variety of time periods, and most importantly, by independent investigators. You want different people. And we know from recent reviews of the psychological literature, things aren't that great. It's so hard to replicate the exact findings that have been reported, published in peer review articles in the psychology field. So what's evidence-based public health? Evidence-based public health refers to the development, implementation, evaluation of effective programs and policies in public health through applications of principles of scientific reasoning and appropriate use of behavioral science theory and program planning models According to Ross Brownson and his colleagues, 2011, there's the book. What are some of the characteristics of effectiveness-based decision-making in the evidence-based model? You use the best available, not the best possible, peer-reviewed quantitative and qualitative data, not just the quantitative. And the other important thing is uh, in that statement is the best available. So I was talking to Professor Fisher about this last night. You know, why didn't the scientists move more quickly on HIV AIDS? It was because they wanted to get more evidence. They actually wanted to, you know, we don't have enough, we don't have enough information yet, it's still unclear. So they kept putting off making announcements. Whereas in the public health realm, you've got to move quickly or you're not gonna be successful. Other components, program planning, transparency, accountability, dissemination. It's so important to apply a program planning framework to engage the community in decision-making, to conduct summative evaluation, that's process impact and outcome evaluation, and to disseminate your research findings and lessons learned so that other people can criticize them, can build upon them. <clears throat> can challenge you, and if they find them useful, use them. Look at this slide. There are different types of evidence to consider in evidence-based public health. Public health is concerned with action, doing something, and responds to three types of evidence. This is in Ross Brownson's book. Type one evidence defines the causes, magnitude, and severity of diseases, plus the risk factors associated with them. This kind of information says you either should do something or you shouldn't. But it doesn't tell you what to do. For that kind of information, you gotta get the type two evidence. 
because type two evidence describes the relative impact of interventions that either do or do not improve health and solve a public health problem. This and not that should be done. You need type two evidence for that. Type three evidence, that's what I'm interested in. What is type three evidence? Well, before I move on, take a look at that third bullet. The inverse evidence law <coughs> may apply to type two evidence. That is, the interventions most likely to influence a population and give you the biggest bang for the buck may have the weakest scientific evidence. And then finally, the third one that I am really interested in. Type three evidence shows how and under what contextual conditions interventions either succeeded or failed and to what extent. Okay, so if that's true, Whoops, I keep doing this wrong. I punched the right one, but it not what I wanted to do. If that's true, then we've got to make a distinction between epidemiology, prevention science, and program science, and we need to move beyond epidemiology. So epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants or causes of disease. It shapes policy decisions by identifying risk factors and intervention targets. But prevention science, and at one time I was chief of the behavioral and prevention research branch at CDC before I retired. Prevention science addresses issues facing at risk populations. It tests interventions and evaluates short-term impact and outcomes. And I think that's what INCHEP does a lot of. The third type of science, program science, focuses on the functioning of entire programs, not the components, not the interventions, but the whole thing taken together. And that's important, particularly if you're interested in exchanges, because sometimes the results you get are not those that you anticipate. Program science focuses on the functioning of entire programs, how they are built, how they are put together, how they're constructed, how well they're funded or not funded how well they're implemented or not, and how well they're evaluated to assure at least these two things. Effectiveness, do they work in the real world, and efficiency. Can we do it better for less costs? I can't stop without mentioning the success of the smallpox eradication program and one of the most important people who was involved in that. He's as tall as LeBron James, and he doesn't bounce a basketball. <laughs> His name is Bill Feige. There he is receiving a Medal of Honor from the President of the United States, Barack Obama. In this paper that he published in Public Health Reports 2010, Dr. Feige, former director of the Centers for Disease Control Prevention, for many years associated with the Carter Center in Atlanta, wrote, the real causes, hey, that's how we began today, talking about causes. The real causes of many deaths are social determinants. And he lists a whole bunch of them, including literacy, illiteracy, gender bias, racial bias, unemployment, and poverty. Another quote, the marketplace that controls healthcare is concerned primarily with profit, only secondarily with patients or with quality of care. Third bullet. Unfortunately, treating disease is reimbursable, but preventing it is not. So he's got a solution. We need a healthcare model that focuses not on access, but on outcomes. Can you prove your worth? Show me what you're able to accomplish, and we'll reward you for that. So I want to close on this before I summarize and conclude. The theme for World AIDS Day, December 1st, 2017, was this. Transparency, accountability, and partnerships. The goals of the World Health Organization, getting to zero, are zero fear, zero stigma, zero discrimination, zero ignorance, zero risk, zero new cases, zero deaths. References to zero all over the place. And how are we going to increase impact? Do what Bill Fagey says. Look at the outcomes. Look at our achievements. 
We're going to do it through transparency, accountability, and partnerships. We're going to disclose information that is not biased, not distorted, or embellished. We're going to accept responsibility for our decisions, our actions, and our outcomes, and we're going to form true partnerships, true collaborations, where there's going to be cooperation to achieve mutual interest through shared decision-making. And aspiration, a worthy goal, a commitment. Let me summarize. Public health consists of facts, fiction, and folklore, and is still poorly understood and appreciated. Outbreaks involve in epidemics and later endemics when public health authorities fail to act quickly. Politicians would rather fund expensive treatment programs for innocent victims than prevention. Health education, one of the most effective tools for a prevention is least likely to be adequately funded of all of the options. And finally, failures in public health are more often due to a lack of understanding of the social and behavioral factors than to the biomedical ones. So it's so nice to be here at INCHIP, where I think people think a little bit differently about the importance of social and behavioral factors than unfortunately many people do. So finally, in terms of a stitch of time. I believe that war is too important to be left to the generals and public health is too important to be left to the biomedical experts. Funding prevention must have precedence over funding for therapy. Prevention programs must be properly designed, developed, implemented, and evaluated for effectiveness in communities at risk. Effective public health programs, prevention programs must be fully funded and sustained by both local and federal funds. And finally, politicians, public health authorities, and non-governmental organization recipients of public funds must be held accountable for their successes and for their failures. And my last slide is this one. <clears throat> so if you like or don't like anything I've said, you want to read more to get angrier or to <laughs> know where it's coming from. There are three papers I published in recently, including one in a very fine journal called AIDS and Behavior. I know the editor and he's a very nice man. I would be very honored uh, if he would introduce me someday. And then finally, if you want to see some cartoons, uh, I suggest that you take a look at Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner. And uh, those are my remarks. And I, ah, I've left at least five minutes or 10 minutes for comments, questions, anything you want to say before we adjourn.